we, um, in chapter 9, and actually from 7 on, we saw that God uses things in the Old Testament in order to be a teaching model. That's what the Old Testament is completely about. And so it's really interesting if you study the Bible that way and you find Jesus on every page. And uh, the tabernacle is probably overwhelmingly the most um, thing in the Old Testament that is filled with that type of typology. So every little piece of that uh, tabernacle can be scripturally shown through references of other scriptures to be pointing to Jesus. Now, I used to have an, an old lady friend and she had a presentation on the tabernacle that she done it with slides. How many of you remember those things, you know, and had the slides? Well, it was about three and a half hours long and I loved her to death, but she was a terrible presenter and there was just way more in this three and a half hour torture of the tabernacle than you ever wanted to know. But it was very interesting and I spent a lot of time with her and I, I don't know what happened to that stuff, but that would be very cool to have. She uh, had spent a bunch of money and had this stuff all done up. But every little piece of that thing God told him to specifically do that because he's trying to teach about Jesus to come. So in the instance of the blood, the blood's to teach about there's going to be some blood one day that's going to be so precious it'll pay for all the sin. And that's just a type. And so we got off on these types and I just jumped at the opportunity to teach about one of my greatest uh, ideals on this and that was the Gibeonites. Now um, this Gibeonite saga would be a great uh, play and it would be four acts and it's, it's very interesting you can study it your whole life. There's people that's given their whole life to it. In act one we see it um, get instituted in this terrible situation where Jacob's daughter, Dinah, gets raped and kidnapped. And, um, you know, um, I just want to say this. So you study those 12 sons of Jacob. There were 12 sons by four wives and if you just study their lives they're some of the most bloodthirsty evil conniving devilish people in the Old Testament let's just stop and think about it for a second how about Judah Judah was the tribe Jesus is born into but the namesake for that tribe Judah was a terrible man. Terrible. Can anybody remember what Judah did? That was so terrible. Well, he was such a terrible man <laughs> that he went to town for the sheep shearing. And the sheep shearing was a time where everybody would gather around, they'd probably help each other and stuff. And basically, it was a time for men to have a party. And his daughter-in-law, she knew him so well, she knew when he goes to Vegas, what goes done in Vegas stays in Vegas. How many of you remember that? She knew every time he went to town, especially for the sheep shearing deal, he went to a prostitute. Now, what kind of godly example of man of God is this? And so she set up a tent like a prostitute, and sure enough, there he went, right? But I want to point out to you that the Bible says in the new heavens, when everything's wrapped up and God makes a new heaven and a new earth, 
there's 12 gates to get into this city, and each one of them is named after one of those scoundrels. So, if you're sitting here, and maybe you've had a bad week, and maybe you've said some things you shouldn't have said, or maybe you've done something that uh, you're not proud of, uh, hold your head up. If God will call, name a gate after one of these 12, uh, you're doing okay, okay? So I just want you to remember that when we get in this story. So this was two of them, Simeon and Levi, and they murdered a whole city of people. And I believe in the circumcision of these Gibeonites, I believe they had some kind of poison on the knife. Now, most of the time they had knives made out of flint rocks. How would you like to have an operation made out of a flint rock? But I think they were dipping them in something, and I think they just went through there slitting their throats. So let's go to Act 1 here, Genesis 34. And a lot of people don't know this stuff's in the Bible. It said, and they said to them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister to one that is uncircumcised, for that we're reproached unto us. But in this will we consent unto you. If you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised, then we will give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. Well, that's a lie. But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and we'll be gone. And their words pleased Hamar. That's the dad who's the, the king of this tribe. And Shechem is the raping, kidnapping, sweet guy. Hamar's son. And the young man deferred not to do the thing. Now what that means is, now listen, you can have an opinion about the guy all you want, but if you, if you let your emotions or your opinions get in your way, it'll blind you from the type that God's trying to set. I'm not up here trying to tell you that Shechem was a great guy. I'm just telling you that God used them as a type of salvation, and he protected them forever. And what I want to show you tonight is that the devil tried to wipe them out over and over and over, and the devil used men who were types of the Antichrist to slaughter these people who were the example of salvation. And I think they understood that they had a covenant with God, not just with Jacob. What? He deferred not to do the thing. He runs to the front of the line to receive salvation. The act of circumcision was given to Abraham as a, a sign of a covenant of salvation. And Abraham's salvation is a lot like ours. It was by faith that God made a covenant with himself. He put Abraham asleep so Abraham couldn't mess it up or break it. And then God made a covenant with himself on behalf of Abraham. And when he woke Abraham up, he said, hey, guess what? Good news, this is the gospel today. I made a covenant with myself on your behalf. Well, that's what happened with us. God, through the life of Jesus and the death and the burial and the resurrection, made a covenant with himself on your behalf. So he ran. He deferred not to do the thing. He jumped at the chance because he had delight in Jacob's daughter and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. And we talked about that. It doesn't say he was honorable. It just said he was more honorable than the rest of them. So this similitude of physical circumcision points to the real circumcision. That is spiritual circumcision. So I ask you guys to do this little exercise. Ask your Christian friends if they know, if they have any idea what happens when a person is born again. And uh, <laughs> Debbie Carr put it out on Facebook again. And it was interesting to hear what people say. 
And I, and I don't think 99% of Christian people even know what happened to them. You know, they say things like, well, you're a new person. Well, yeah, that's, that's what becomes of what happened to you. But, but how did you become a new person? And what makes you a new person? I mean, if you knelt down to receive Christ and you were fat, when you got through praying, you're still fat. You're not a new physical person. If you were redheaded, you get up, you're redheaded. If you were bald-headed, you... It doesn't have a thing to change your flesh or your body, but your body benefits from it from the inside out. So what happened? We've taught it at nauseum. The real circumcision is when God cuts away your flesh from your spirit and your soul when your spirit is quickened to life. Listen, it's the most perfect plan. It's the only way that you could be uh, saved. It's the only way that God, being a just judge, could justify you in order to give you eternal life. Think about it for a minute. The word justified means just as if you had never sinned. How can God, he's true and he's just, he can't just say, I'm going to cover their sin and act like it never happened. He's got to have a way to make a part of you that has never sinned. So when he quickens your spirit to life by his word, his seed, you've got to hear the gospel, and he cuts away your flesh from your soul and your spirit, then whatever you do with your body will not send your spirit and soul to hell because it doesn't contaminate it. You're living inside your flesh. So if your flesh uh, steals some money from work or something, uh, that's a bad thing. And you'll reap what you sow in your body. And the judgment seat of Jesus is for the born-again people, and it says they are judged. There's a lot of people who preach it's not judgment for what they did in their body. So if you, let's say, embezzle from work, you may be born again, but you may have to go to prison. It, you may be born again, but uh, if you take a chainsaw and cut your arm off, your arm going to fall off. So whatever you do in your body, now it doesn't contaminate your spirit. That's a perfect plan. Perfect plan. That's why... When John wrote his epistles, John says, if you're born of God's seed, you do not sin. Well, all the door shut. Have you sinned today? How are you going to rectify that? In another book he wrote, he said, if you say you have no sin, you've made a liar out of God. Well, you've got to have some way to rectify it or just keep your head in the sand. And if you keep your head in the sand, you leave another part of your anatomy exposed. If you say you have not sinned, you've made God a liar. Well, of course you sin. You sin all the time. I sin all the time. Why? Because my sinless spirit and soul stuck in this stupid flesh. But then he says, if you're born of God's seed, you do not sin. Well, that's talking about your spirit. Ain't, your flesh ain't born of God's seed. Well, that rectifies it, doesn't it? Now, I got to get going, and we're never going to get there. So that's act one. So Jacob's daughter from Leah goes to town. Probably shouldn't have went to town. Um, I was, me and Peggy was invited over to the Ponderosa across the street last night to our neighbors and had homemade cappuccino and some kind of heavenly dessert. And we got to talking about cities. You know, the Bible doesn't say one good thing about a city. I don't think God intended people to live in cities. Because when you all get together, that's when you start dreaming up sin, you know. So she gets raped. And then the sons of Jacob use this circumcision as an agent of death instead of eternal life. And God was furious. So act two, 
we saw last time, Joshua 9, verse 3. So this is a few hundred years later. And when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done unto Jericho and to Ai, they did work uh, uh, wily and, and went and made as if they had been ambassadors and took old sacks upon their asses and wine bottles old and rent and bound up and old shoes and clotted upon their feet that means patched them and old garments upon them and all the bread of their provision was dry and moldy and they went to Joshua unto the camp of Gilgal and they said unto him and to the men of Israel we be come from a far country now therefore make you a league with us now, you go back to the first verse, there are three, it says they heard. Well, I think they probably had some spies in there. And this is when Joshua go, and the children of Israel go over the Jordan into Canaan land. The Gibeonites are in Canaan land. Well, they knew because Joshua read the first five books of the Old Testament to the whole congregation. So if they had spies in there, they heard it. And it said to kill them all. Unless they were from a far off country, then make peace with them. So the Gibeonites had already in their history had a dealing with these people. And they had heard what God had done in Egypt. And then what God had already done in Canaan land. And they knew they weren't going to make it. That God was so powerful, he's going to destroy them. So they sought to trick them. They sought to make up a lie, so they sent out a group of them. They acted like they had come from a long ways off. And Joshua, the Bible says, he didn't, he didn't ask the Lord. And so he said, okay, we'll make a peace treaty with you. And then they found out they had been lied to, but they had already given them their word. So he said, well, I'll tell you what, we're going to let you live, but you're going to have to uh, bring the wood and the water to the tabernacle forever well he just made them priests so God is protecting them over and over and over and it's a really cool thing so look at verse 27 chapter 9 verse 27 and Joshua made them that day hewers of wood and drawers of water for the congregation and for the altar of the Lord, even unto this day, in the place which he should choose. So he thought he was really doing something bad to them, but he just protects them and makes them priests. So, let's go to Act 3. Now, the devil wants to kill them because they're a walking around physical type of salvation through a covenant. So the devil wants to kill them. So at the end, that's the end of, ver of chapter 9. Now they're in the Canaan land. You go right to chapter 10. Now you might know chapter 10 is where the sun stands still. Let's go there. Joshua 10, verse 1. Okay? So Joshua 10, 1. Now it came to pass... When Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. Now, anybody see anything there? Come on, look real hard. Okay, we don't have time. Ready? And it came to pass when Adonai, I'm trying to give it for reference, <laughs> Zedek. Well, what is Adonai? You ever heard that word before? Sure, it means king. A lot of times it's used about the Lord. It means the Lord as a ruler, king. Okay, Adonai. You've heard that, right? Zedek. Zedek means what? 
righteousness. So Adonai Zedek means the king of righteousness. Now we just spent about six weeks talking about a guy whose name was Melchizedek. Remember? So Mel, Mel Kiz Zedek was the king of righteousness. The king of Salem. Well, he was the king of Jerusalem before it was named Jerusalem. When he was the king, when Abraham was living with Lot, remember? It, Jerusalem was called Salem, or peace. So, Jesus Christ, I believe, was Melchizedek. He was the manifestation of God in a human body, and he dealt with Abraham and those people around as the priest of God, teaching Abraham about the things of God, and he was the king of that city, Jerusalem. Well, now... These giants and hybrids have all infiltrated Canaan land, God's land, right? And you got a joker who his name is King of Jerusalem, King of Righteousness, and he's the King of Jerusalem. Now, we know it's not Jesus, right? So, let's... If you got a guy who has taken the kingship of Jerusalem and he's taken the name King of Righteousness, which was the name of Melchizedek, then who is this guy a type of in God's types and similitudes? Now remember, these are hybrid, giant, devil-worshipping, cannibal, infant, blood-sucking, devil-worshipping, who is this guy? Well, he's a type of the Antichrist. He's a type of the Antichrist. He's the king of Jerusalem. His name is King of Righteousness. He's taken the title of Jesus Christ. Everybody with me? Now, there's an Antichrist coming, and he will take that title. There's a man that is a procession of popes who take the title now. One of the titles of the pope, doesn't matter what pope's sitting there, right now we got two popes. I don't know how you do that, but they got two popes. That one pope is under pope arrest. Now what about that bunch of people that claim to believe that this pope guy is God in the flesh on earth and they put him under house arrest? I don't know. I mean, there's, they believe weirder things than that, but um, their title is King of Jerusalem. That's why he wears a half a grapefruit. What's that called, Diana, the little half a grapefruit? Huh? Yarmulke. What's a, what's a uh, European Vatican resident pope wearing a yarmulke for? Peggy was talking to this guy the other day. He's trying to invite him to church and he said, well, we're Messianic Jews. I just about... If I, did, if I didn't have polygrip in, I'd have spit them across the room. <laughs> That's the craziest... People, let me just say something. Cause we're all we're all friends in here. When you get out them doors, this world, they're crazy. They're nuts. They'll believe anything, and they'll believe a lie way quicker than they will the truth. And it's getting worse and worse and worse. And the Bible said, "Look out for it. Wrong will be right, and right will be wrong." I got here this afternoon, and Jackie said, "Have you heard the new terminology called furries?" I said, no. She said, that's people that uh, identify as animals. Well, I've always called David a dog, so I guess we've been doing that for a long time. I don't know. 
So I just want you to see, this king of Jerusalem, he's a type, we're talking about types, of the Antichrist. And what's he want to do? He wants to kill Gibeonites because they have salvation. And the Antichrist, all throughout the Bible, all the different types of the Antichrist, in the Bible, there's 18 types of the Antichrist. Well, some of you mathematicians said 18. Wow, that's 6 plus 6 plus 6. Yeah. In the Bible, there's 18 different types. And one way you can find them is they try to annihilate people with salvation. Listen, Adolf Hitler tried to annihilate the Jews. Do you know who funded him? Jews. The richest people in the world, they were Jews. I, I've got uh, I, I, somewhere at my house, I've got photographs of shell oil tankers backed up to the gas, uh, where they gassed them. Shell oil is owned by Jews. Come on. You, I mean, you can't be stupid your whole life. Now, you can get mad and leave. You know, we used to have a couple here, and the woman left because she didn't like what I said about, about Israel. Let me tell you, let's make sure if you're in her camp, they're going to go to hell if they don't believe in Jesus. They don't have some special inroad. They're just one door. And anybody that tries to come any other way is a thief and a liar. And I'm, I'm just going to lay it all out there. They've They've masterfully took trillions of dollars from stupid Christian Americans. The Bible says if you'll bless them, he'll bless you. That's not what it says. God told Abraham that. God told Abraham, I will bless people that bless you. I'll curse them that curse you. But the people in Israel today are not even Jewish descent. Now, as soon as you say that, you say, oh, he don't like Israel. I'm going to tell you something. Here pretty quick, God's face is going to turn back to Israel, and, and he's going to protect them, and he's got a plan for them. But to say that they don't need Jesus Christ, that's blasphemy. So you got this that just jumps off the page at you. This guy's a type of the Antichrist. He took the name of Jesus Christ, King of Jerusalem, King of Righteousness. That was Melchizedek's name. What's he want to do? He wants to annihilate the Gibeonites because they have salvation. Watch. This is just Act 3, right? So uh, let's go... Uh, to verse 2. That they feared greatly because Gibeon was such a great city and one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore, Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hoham, king of Hebron. I looked all these guys' names up today. It's amazing what their names are. You ought to look them up. And unto Param, king of Jarmuth, and unto Japhia, king of Lashes, and unto uh, Deborah, king of Iglong, saying, so this Adonai Zedek, he says, come, in verse 4, he says, come unto me and help me, that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and with the children of Israel. Therefore, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem and the king of Hebron, the king of Jamar, the king of Lashes, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and they went up, they and all their host, and encamped before Gibeon and made war against it. Now, the Gibeonites got grafted in to the salvation that Jacob's sons enjoyed. The Bible says we as Gentiles got grafted in to the salvation of the Jews. Salvation is of the Jews. 
Jesus was not a Christian. These are Gibeonites. They're Gentiles, but they got in on the salvation because the Jew used it against them to kill them, but God honored it anyway. Watch it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp of Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. Well, who are they asking to save them? Who'd they send that letter to? All right, what is wrong with you people? Who are they asking? And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua. Well, what is Joshua's name? Jesus. In the Old Testament, to translate Yahshua, the Hebrew spelling of the name of God, into English, it comes out Joshua, you know, Yahshua. They, they, like the Spanish people, they don't say they're J's. They say them like an H. You know, remember Sunday school, I told you, you know, if you're going to go on vacation in Mexico, the best time is Hoon or Hulai. In the Greek, the name comes out Jesus. That's his name in the English, translated from the Greek, translated from the Hebrew name. Now, your Messianic Jews or your, uh, your Gentiles that want to be Jewish, they don't think you can be saved unless you say the right name. So if you're praying and you say Jesus, you're just as lost as lost can be because he won't hear you unless you say Yeshua HaMashiach and you got to say it like they do and none of them can you know you got to say it like you got something caught in your throat <laughs> don't they die well these crazy Hebrew roots people and stuff they're hung up on the name and what they do it for is to throw it around to try to manipulate you to make you think you're stupid and unlearned and and they know the name. Do you know what the Bible says about the name of God? It's the unmutable, immutable, unknowing name. That can't nobody say it. In the Hebrew, it's four letters, no consonants. How are you going to pronounce it? You can't pronounce it. Now, the Jews at one time knew how to say it, but they held it in such great regard that they forgot how to say it. They wouldn't say it. But it's four letters and no vowels. And you can say it. You can say it. You can't say it. And it's just crazy when they try to make you feel this big. Oh, you know, I don't know. Who are you praying to? This Jesus. Who is that? Well, in English, his name is Jesus. What do you think his name is in Beijing, China? You think the Chinese people are over there saying, Y'all you a homosexual? No. Listen, Jesus knows all their languages. So they cried out to Jesus or Joshua. What'd they say? Save us. I just think that's pretty cool. So they cried out to Jesus. They sent a messenger, Save us, help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. Have you ever been in a situation where you couldn't pray some beautiful prayer and basically all you did was cry it out, save me, help me? I was in a situation one time, I've told this story before, I won't tell the whole story. I was in a situation, I was at my wit's end, it's probably... 15 years ago, 20 years ago, probably 20 years ago now, time flies. And um, I just finally had prayed myself out. And i just be honest with you, I didn't feel anything and I didn't feel any better and the situation wasn't any better and, and there wasn't any magic dust to put on it. And so I just found myself saying, please. And what, what I was saying was help me. But I just kept saying, please, please, please. I, I, I didn't know what else to say. 
And then finally, and I'm not proud of this, but I said, you know, if you're not going to help me, then what good are you? Let me encourage you. Don't ever do that. And I was in, a, I was in this car, and immediately I, I felt the power of God hit that car. I thought the windshield busted out of it. And I don't know how long I stayed in there, but when he got through with me, uh, he had really helped me. And that sustained me for years to come. I can't explain it to you and wouldn't even try. I, I'm kind of like Paul. If I tried, I think it would be unlawful to even try to tell you. But that's what they asked. They said, save us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomforted them, which the word means destroyed them, before Israel, and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon, and chased them along the way that goeth up to Betharon, and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. Who did? The Lord did. And it came to pass as they fled from before Israel and were in the going down to Betharon, that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. God is really good at throwing rocks. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel, which the Gibeonites are Amorites, and he said in the sight of Israel, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Ajalon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed, until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. Is not this written in the book of Jasher? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man, for the Lord fought for Israel. Now, we're not even going to touch this. The Bible said the sun stood still. You know, I've asked a lot of people, how did God do that? And they said, well, he stopped the earth. Well, wouldn't we all fling off? <laughs> it's supposed to be rotating at 67,000 miles per hour. Now, that ain't what it says. It says he stopped the sun. But we're not going to touch that. I just want to see if you see this in the last verse. Now, I want to read it to you again. And there was no day like it before or after it, that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. Anybody see anything? Well, let's break it down. So the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. Now, traditionally, God gives us word and we hearken to his word. But in this case, the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. Now, what man do you think that is referring to, and what did he say? Anybody? Joshua. And what he said was for the sun to stop and the moon to stop, right? So God did that. Well, in the Old Testament, um, God would perform the words of the prophets. You know, if, if Elijah said it ain't going to rain three and a half years, it, then God wouldn't let it rain. So that's not really odd. The point I'm hoping you would catch, look what it says. For the Lord fought for Israel. Now let me back up a minute and refresh your memory what happened. These Gibeonites, they were cutting wood 
and hauling water for Joshua's tabernacle. They had a city that they lived in. They had some that were given, I guess, continually into the service. They knew what Deuteronomy said when Joshua read it, that God said, when you go over Jordan, destroy them all. Unless they're from a far off country, then make peace with them. So they said, we can't fight this God. Look at what he's done in Egypt. He destroyed, Egypt was the most powerful thing on the planet, and he destroyed it. Look what he done at Ai. Look what he done at uh, Jericho. We can't fight them man for man. We must outsmart them. They said, well, we'll just try to make peace with them. So they made peace with them. They made them priests. So immediately this Antichrist guy, right, king of righteousness, began to try to kill them for their making peace or receiving salvation. So they call out to Jesus or Joshua to save them. And they come and save them. But was God fighting for Israel or for the Gibeonites? And the whole battle was against the Gibeonites. And I think it's something that needs to be noticed that God considers the Gibeonites his Israel. Now listen, there is a nation of Israel. But what you're going to see tonight is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, there's a period of time when the church is there. And Paul says, there's neither Jew nor Greek. And this Israel is a spiritual thing, the descendants of Abraham in a spiritual way. So God just considers them Israel. I think it's very cool. So the last act is Act 4. Uh, you have a probably, if not the greatest, one of the greatest types of the Antichrist in the Old Testament is Saul. And what you find is Saul, the type of Antichrist, tries to annihilate the Gibeonites once again. Now this is several hundred years later, and Saul, for whatever reason, he was a demoniac, crazy nut. He tries to kill them all. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 21. Now, when Saul tried to annihilate all the Gibeonites was somewhere between 35 and 40 years before this right here, okay? Now, why did God wait 35 or 40 years? Nobody knows, but God's real patient. But here's where we pick up the story. Now then, David is king. This is at the end of his reign, okay? Then there was a famine in the days of David three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered. Now, what is the most obvious question there? I'll give it to you for free. Why did he wait three years? Three years? For some crazy reason, he waits three years. Could it be that as the king, he was kind of insulated against this terrible famine? I don't know. But for whatever reason, he waits three years. He inquires of the Lord. He says, Lord, why are you putting us through this famine? Watch what the Lord says. And the Lord answered, it is for Saul and for his bloody house. So remember that. That's something you need to remember. It's for Saul and for his bloody house because he slew the Gibeonites. Really? So God has put Israel through a famine. They ain't no telling how many of them's died. And God just sat there, didn't say a word till David inquired. You know, prayer, sometimes you have not because you ask not. God said, well, I'll tell you why. Because 40 years ago, Saul tried to kill all the Gibeonites. What? 
Then there was, uh, and the king called the Gibeonites and said unto them, now the Gibeonites, in parentheses, watch, you know, watch this. Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites, and the children of Israel had sworn unto them, and Saul sought to slay them in his zeal to the children of Israel and Judah. So that is just, you know, in parentheses, that's a thought capsule in case you didn't know who the Gibeonites were, right? So go back to that verse, if you will, guys. So Saul sought to kill him. And this verse is really strange. It says he sought to kill him because of his zeal for the children of Israel. Now, should Saul, should Saul have had zeal for the children of Israel or for God? Saul's always blaming the children of Israel. You know, when he came back and he had Agag and he hadn't killed him and he had all those really nice animals and all that, he blamed the people then. Samuel said, well, you didn't do what God told you to do. And he said, hey, I brought back the stuff to sacrifice to God. I'm going to look real good because I'm going to sacrifice all this really good stuff to God. And Samuel said, God doesn't have any pleasure in sacrifice. And it's better to obey than to sacrifice. And this day, your kingship's been rent from you. But here's another thing. He killed them because of his zeal for the people. He should have had zeal for God. Look, verse 3. Wherefore David said unto the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And wherewith shall I make the atonement? So atonement means a payment. So nothing is atoned for without blood. The Gibeonites knew full well why the Israelites were under uh, God's judgment. Because Saul, a type of the Antichrist, tried to kill them all. Wherewith shall I make this atonement that ye may bless the inheritance of the Lord? And the Gibeonites said unto him, We will have no silver. Now remember, silver always talks about atonement. Silver is always about atonement, and atonement's always about blood. That's why silver's called what? Blood money. Remember Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver? And when he went and threw it back, listen, he's not throwing it back because he repented. He's not throwing it back because he's sorry. He's throwing it back so he can fulfill Scripture in Isaiah. They said, we don't want no silver nor gold of Saul, nor of his house, neither... For us shall thou kill any man in Israel. Well, that sounds like some pretty cool dudes, right? And he said, What ye shall say, that will I do for you. And they answered the king, The man that consumed us and that devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the coast of Israel, they tried to wipe them out. Let seven men of his sons be delivered unto us, and we will hang them up until the Lord in Gibeah of Saul. They're going to offer seven sons of Saul as a sacrifice to the Lord. Now, when you hear these guys, most of them are actually grandsons, but the Jewish people don't defer between sons and grandsons okay so he said bring seven of them whom the Lord did choose and the king said I will give them hmm okay but the king spared Mephibosheth the son of Jonathan the son of Saul because of the Lord's oath that was between them between David and Jonathan the son of Saul how many of you remember Mephibosheth yeah, great story, you know. He's the one, um, when Saul and Jonathan died, his maid just figured David would kill him so he could take the throne. 
but the maid didn't know that David and Jonathan had an oath, had a covenant, and so she was running, and she tripped and fell and broke both of his legs, and they never did heal right. So he was crippled, Mephibosheth. When David was just mourning for his friend years later, 40 years later, he just said, man, isn't there any descendants of Jonathan that I can be kind to? And finally, some servant ratted Mephibosheth out because Mephibosheth had stayed in Lodibar his whole life hidden out from David because he believed what his nanny had told him that David would kill him so he could take the rightful throne. And this servant of David said, well, there is a son, Mephibosheth. David said, go get him. And he gave him everything that was Saul. This is a great story, whatever. So David didn't take him over there, right? Now you're going to see Mephibosheth's name, but that's a cousin to Mephibosheth. They're just named Mephibosheth, both of them, okay? Seems weird to us, but in this church we got three Tims, okay? People can have the same name. So here you go. But the king took the two sons of, of Rispa, the daughter of Ea, whom she bare unto Saul, Am, Ammoni, and Mephibosheth. That's hers, but that's not Jonathan's Mephibosheth. And the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul. Now Michael was the daughter of Saul that Saul gave to David when he, when he killed Goliath. And she was a little sassy witch. And so David never would have sex with her and she lived her whole life barren remember she's the one that got embarrassed because david was praising the lord he said i can be worse than that you think that was bad and he said because of your mouth you know you're not ever going to have a child so when you read that you immediately say well i didn't think she had five sons she didn't but she brought up for Adriel, the son of Barzilla, the Maholite. So she raised these sons, but she didn't give birth to them, okay? And he delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the hill before the Lord. And they fell all seven together and were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days. That's about 1st April. In the beginning of the barley harvest, 1st of April. And Rizpah, the daughter of Ai, took sackcloth and spread it for her upon the rock from the beginning of harvest until water dropped upon them out of heaven and suffered neither the birds of the air to rest on them by day nor the beast of the field by night. Now, there's, um, there's called a latter rain in the first rain which is 60 days after the 1st of April. That's what I think. I think she protected them for 60 days. But most Bible scholars say the latter rain, which would be in the fall, five months. I don't think she stayed out there for five months, okay? But either way, you can believe whatever. And it was told David what Rispah, the daughter of Ai, the concubine of Saul, had done. And David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jephthah's Gilead, which had stolen them from the street of Besham, where the Philistines had hung them when the Philistines had slain Saul in Gilboa. And he brought up from thence the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, and they gathered the bones of them that were hanged. And the bones of Saul and Jonathan his son buried they in the country of Benjamin and Zela in the sepulcher of Kish his father. And they performed all that the king commanded. And after that, God was entreated for the land. It's a very intriguing story. So if you want some homework, why did she beat the birds off of them and the beast off of them for 60 days, possibly five months. That's a good homework question. Now let's go to Hebrews 10. This is a Hebrew study, right? So on the back of that, look at Hebrews 10. 
for the law, having a shadow of good things to come. So the complete law was a type to teach you about something good to come, okay? And not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Now that sentence right there to a Jew would get you killed. Because what he just said was all those sacrifices did not make the ones that brought them sinless or perfect. Right? Verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Well, that makes sense, don't it? If Tanya brings an offering for sin, what's she got to keep bringing it back for? If the offering covers her sin, why does she have to keep bringing it back over and over and over? For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because that the worshipers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin. Well, the sacrifices couldn't purge them of sin. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance, again, made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Now, we need to figure this out. So why did God have them for thousands of years go through these rituals and they're very strict and all of these animals had to lose their life and their blood was on the altar? Why? Because he's teaching about a sacrifice that would come when he sacrifices himself. He's teaching about blood is precious. Well, we teach about blood a lot, don't we? It is precious. Do you know what you need right now? You need a blood transfusion. What you really need is some perfect blood and some perfect flesh. That's why Melchizedek brought the wine and the bread. That's why Jesus had the wine and the bread. That's why we have a communion service. Because we're looking to one day to the sacrifice that was made that covers all. R right now, what you need, what you really need is a blood transfusion. So until Jesus come, God used the blood of animals that were innocent to cover people, but it didn't take the sin away. That's why no one in the Old Testament went to heaven. Their sins were not taken away. They were covered. They were pushed out. But the penalty was still there. It had not been paid for. So when Jesus came, the Bible says he paid for the sins of all the Old Testament saints and all those in the future. So he went to the holding place and told them, now you're eligible to go to heaven. So, wherefore then he cometh into the world, he saith, sacrifice and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now go back to that, if you will, to verse 7. Notice that's in parentheses again. It's thrown in there as its own thought. He said, I come. How does he come? In the volume of the book, it's about him. Well, what book do you think they're talking about here in Hebrews 10? They're talking about the Old Testament. To do thy will, O God. Above when he said sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first to establish the second. In other words, he takes away the first covenant and established a better or second covenant. 
by the which will we are sac sac uh, sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standing daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices over and over and over which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Now I want to ask you something. It's hard for us to wrap our brains around it. But this plan that God had before was that animals would be brought and they had to be a type of him in the fact that they had to be as pure as they could be. The red heifer couldn't have two different colored hairs. The lambs had to be without spot and blemish. That's because they're pointing to God himself. They're uh, a type of God's sacrifice. You couldn't take a broken-legged uh, lamb, just getting rid of it, you know, making good use of it. It had to be perfect without spot and blemish. And then Jesus comes. Now, if the blood of the animals could cover the sin and put away the punishment for a period of thousands of years in some cases, the blood of Jesus redeems you, wipes it away. The other blood Remission just forgives it. Redemption, I've told you a thousand times, is the word for wiping it away. That's how he can say he doesn't remember it anymore. So when he gets ready to build his new city, the new heaven, it's the crystal city, when he names the gates, he's not remembering that Levi and Simeon kill those Gibeonites. You know, he's not having the conversation. Well, I, shucks, man. I, I was wanting to name them 12 gates after them 12 boys. But you know that one, he went to a prostitute, and them other two, they bloodthirsty. They killed all them Gibeonites. No, what he remembers is his oath and his covenant that he had with Abraham, their grandpa. And they benefited from it. And when he thinks about you, he thinks about you in a select group called his bride. And when he thinks about you, he thinks about how much he loves you and how much he cares for you and how they, you have been given by grace this salvation. He doesn't remember all that stuff that you've done. Now, it's hard to wrap your brain around it. But if he can take people who were saved initially under that system of bulls and goats and make gates to the, his eternal home with their names on them, you are the bride that lived there. Let me tell you something. The 12 boys that's got their names on the gates, they don't live there. They live on the earth, on the new earth. Only the bride of Christ lives with the groom, Jesus Christ. So I think sometimes we don't really realize what's been afforded us. So, the Apostle Paul puts it best, now that you know that he, when he forgives you, he forgets, does that give you a license to just go out and sin? No. It should encourage you that you don't have to worry about if he's looking down on you or condemning you or whatever. He made that in himself that when he forgave you, he could forget it. And I'm going to leave you with this. <laughs> I want you to think. 
Because God, before the foundation of the world, before he created anything, he made up his mind what he was going to do. And what he, what he said, he had a conversation with himself, and he said, I tell you what I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to uh, redeem them back to myself. And then I'm going to forget and forgive their sin. Now, you stop for a minute. When you do that, that makes you very vulnerable. When you forget what somebody's done to you, they can do it to you again. They can do it to you again. That makes you very vulnerable. When you choose to forget what somebody's done to you, and we can't, but he did, that makes you where they can make you out to be a fool. So I want to ask you, if you had the ability, if you had the ability to when you forgave somebody, you would forget what they'd done to you, would you choose it? Now what we like to do most of the time is we like to say we forgive them, but we don't want to forget it. I want you to feel what he feels like when he chose to make himself that vulnerable. So you got to ask yourself the question, why would he do it? Let me just tell you and I'll be done. Because he so valued his relationship with you that nothing would come between you that he chose to be able to forget the sin that you've committed. You wrap your brain around that, you'll be a long way down the road. Do you love people enough that if you had the ability, you would choose to forget the terrible things that they've done to you just so you could not have bad feeling for them? I think that's a level of love that we do not understand. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Yeah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and uh, for your salvation plan. Um, It's just unbelievable. And we just study and study and study, and we just feel like we're scratching the surface, that you could uh, grant salvation to a group of people and set them as a type of your salvation and protect them and keep them, and the devil try to destroy them over and over and over how much more you must love us we thank you we pray for sherry foster we just lift her up to you tonight god and we just ask you to be with her and to touch her and um, if it be your will to touch her body and heal her body in jesus name amen just want to let you know i talked to her earlier